Revelation, if you got your Bibles, like I've already said, hopefully you're already in Revelation chapter 19 as we continue on in this amazing study of the book of Revelation. The theological term is eschatology, the study of end times. We know that John is the author of the book of Revelation. He's been writing all of this amazing stuff as it relates to the end of humanity as we know it. The first few chapters of the book of Revelation have been letters to churches that have been failing. We as a church culture today look at those letters to see if we as a church are emulating the negative elements of the churches in the first part of the book of Revelation. And if so, we wanna make sure that we're steering away from the downfall that we saw in the churches in the first part of the book of Revelation. After that, it moves into this long chapter after chapter after chapter of what is going to happen to the world, the the, the heavens, the earth, and humanity as it relates to when God finally says, I've had enough, I'm done. He's going to destroy the world, destroy the sinners. He will become a new heaven and a new earth. And so as we get in this today, there's going to be some really big points that I want to share with you all this morning in the area of scripture. Now, fireman's story ties kind of into my message today. Um, I would say that it's, it's fair to say that sin is a bondage. Poor choices create a bondage. Uh, things that we do in our life cause us to feel isolated, destroyed, defeated, depressed. If we live in a life that is perpetuated by sin over and over again, we feel like we have no freedom. We feel like we've got no space. We feel as if the world's caving in on us. Circumstances around us, events around us cause us to feel trapped. The word trap now in our culture today is becoming incredibly powerful. We as a culture are being trapped by economics. We as a culture are being trapped by lack of commodities. We as a culture are seeing the people of Ukraine being trapped in buildings, in bunkers. You feel like the world is trapping you inside. And so I went on a call yesterday of a vehicle accident where a lady, I'm assuming based on the scenario, turned left in front of a car and she was in essence T-bone which caused the car to flip up on its side. I've got a, a picture here that I'll show you of kind of what that looked like. And so as we pulled on scene, this car was on its side, the driver, an elderly lady was still in the seat, the roof obviously was still up, she was trapped under the steering wheel, she was laying on the driver's side window, she couldn't get out, she was freaking out, she was trapped inside of that. And that imagery, as I, as I walk up, and, and, and I'm assigned to the, to the responsibility of cutting that car open to get her out of that vehicle, and as I peer in there, she couldn't move, she was completely trapped, it made me realize, man, that, that's kind of what sin does to us, doesn't it? It traps us, it holds us, it confines us, it, it, it makes us have anxiety and depression and, and conflict and, and consequences, and we get trapped in what is happening around us? And so this particular lady, it took us some time and we decided to get out the jaws that we used to spread and we have these powerful cutters and we have a sawzall and we began to cut the posts and break glass and we decided that we're gonna fold this roof down and, and we can pull her literally kind of right out from underneath that and take her out. And I gotta tell you that as we're doing this, it's my responsibility because I work on that big ladder truck and it's my responsibility. I'm given the task of, of I'm assigned rescue. That's the, the, the terminology that my boss gives me. And I'm overseeing this operation. I'm overseeing the success of it. And, and I'm giving direction on what I want done, how I want it done. And my crews, they're, they're cutting to get this particular lady out. And I gotta tell you that once we cut the roof and we were able to peel that back and lay that roof down, it just opened up the whole thing. It changed everything. It, it gave her freedom. You could feel the sense of, of like this deep breath that she had, like, okay, I, I'm free. I'm, I'm out of this scenario. I'm no longer trapped by my circumstances. I'm no longer trapped by this vehicle. And, and as we pulled her out of there, I just got this relief myself being in charge of that, that what I wanted to do worked. 
My plan worked, and I was so excited, and we got her out, and so as we turn into Revelation chapter 19, I want us to keep this, this, this image in the forefront of our mind, because what we're going to see is people celebrating because of the freedoms that they're now having. The freedom from the conflict and the turmoil of of sin in the world, they're now experiencing freedom and escape from their circumstances. So we're gonna look at it here in Revelation chapter 19. We're gonna pick up here in verse three where it says this. And a second time they said, hallelujah. Her smoke rises up forever and ever and the 24 elders and the four living creatures fell down and worshiped God who sits on the throne saying, amen, hallelujah. And a voice came from the throne saying, give praise to our God, all you, his bond servants, you who fear him, the small and the great. Then I heard something like the voice of a great multitude and like the sound of many waters and like the sound of mighty peals of thunder saying, hallelujah, for the Lord our God, the almighty reigns. Let us rejoice and be glad and give the glory to him for the marriage of the lamb has come and his bride has made herself ready. It was given to her, clothe herself in fine linen, bright and clean, for the fine linen is the righteous act of the saints. So let's just pause right there. As we go back over into verse three, we begin to see this second illustration of a celebration by God's saints. They're celebrating the fact that God is about to move and bring about his restoration to his bride. And so those that are around the throne, those that are in heaven are celebrating that soon the chains of the bondage of people that are living in the tribulation period that are believers are going to be saved and reciprocity is about to be given. And so we see here in verse three that this is a continuation literally of verse one where there is this multitude in heaven saying, hallelujah, salvation and glory belong to our God. It is a fascinating thing to think about what it must look like for this scene. People in heaven praising God because God is about to restore his bride. And so I can tell you from that experience of that car accident, the other car was there. There was, as you could imagine, a multitude of people around watching, videotaping as they do. And as soon as we got her out of the vehicle, there was this sense of relief from the onlookers and they don't even know this person. Why? Because they've been set free. We've cut the roof off, she's been set free. And so if that is somewhat moving, imagine what it must be like to be in heaven and see God ready to move to set the sinner free and repay those who continue to sin and want nothing to do with Christ. From the early area of Revelation till now in the book, we have seen God bestowing wrath on humanity during the tribulation period. It's been violent. It's been deadly, it's been destructive. Water, food, economics, politics, finances, all of it has been disturbed under the wrath of God. God, through the book of Revelation, has touched every element of humanity. He's left nothing undone. As a matter of fact, last Sunday, we looked specifically at the end of chapter 18 where John said that in the city of Babylon, there was not even any music anymore. He also said there was no more craftsmanship. Music simply implied that it was no more joy in the city at all. We talked about how music has so powerful and has such an impact in our lives. I told you I was going to see the Elvis movie last Sunday after church. I did go see it. Awesome, by the way. Love it. Huge Elvis fan. Man, Colonel Parker, that guy. Woo. He had some issues, right? You all know about Colonel Parker, so if you haven't, go see it, great movie. But the point of the story is, here we are some 30, 40 years after the death of Elvis, and his music is still impacting people. Why? Because music touches us. And so last Sunday we learned, man, there's not even gonna be even any music anymore, there's no more craftsmanship, meaning that every element of humanity 
will in fact be touched by God. Nothing is sacred. Now, when we've been working our way through the book of Revelation, it would be easy for us to say or assume or think, how can a loving God be so destructive? We've heard that as Christians. We've heard about the atrocities on humanity, and we've heard the questions thrown in our face, if your God loved people, then why did those things happen? Or why are these things happening? But in fact, what we need to be saying as believers in Christ is forget about the issues of justice on a human level, but we need to realize that one day we're going to face the justice of God. See, what happens is, is that Satan is using the injustices of the world to create conflict, to divide churches, to divide families, to divide friends. The injustices of the world are creating conflict. And every single one of us in here struggle as well with the injustices of the world. Go over to Psalms chapter 73, and I wanna look specifically at Psalm 73, where the psalmist writes something that is absolutely beautiful for you and I, especially living in our culture today. Because we live in a culture of unfairness. We live in a culture where there is social unfairness, there's legal unfairness, there's financial unfairness. You and I have the tendency or the propensity to look at the people around us that are not following Christ and begin to question why God allows them to excel. You look around and you see people doing better than you, maybe financially, socially, whatever it is, and you begin to question why God is not dealing with them. Look what the psalmist says in chapter 73 as it specifically points to the same struggle for him back in these days. Look what it says here. Surely God is good to Israel, to those who are pure in heart. But as for me, my feet came close to stumbling. My steps had almost slipped, for I was envious of the arrogant as I saw the prosperity of the wicked. Let's just stop there. Sound familiar? Man, we're, we're, we're envious of those around us. We want to be like them. We want more than them. And, and, and he says here, man, I almost slipped. I almost gave into it. Verse four, for there are no pains in their death and their body is fat. They are not in trouble as other men, nor as they are plagued like mankind. Therefore, pride is their necklace. The garment of violence covers them. Their eyes bulges from fatness. The imaginations of their hearts run riot. They mock and wickedly speak of oppression. They speak from on high. Sound familiar of our government? Those in leadership today, pride and arrogance, and they speak from on high. They speak from an authoritative position. Verse nine, they've set their mouth against the heavens and their tongues parades through the earth. It means that they're in opposition to God and they want what the earth has to offer. They parade themselves around on what, church? Social issues. They sell social issues. Has that not been our country for the last two years? Social issue after social, they pride themselves on it. They line their tongues with the street, verse 10. Therefore, his people return to this place and waters of abundance are drunk by them. They say, how does God know? And is their knowledge with the most high? Behold, these are the wicked and always at ease. They have increased in wealth. Surely in vain I've kept my heart pure and I've washed my hands in innocence for I've been stricken all day long and chastened every morning. Now here comes the woe is me. Man, Lord, I, I've kept myself pure. I've done everything you've asked me to do and I'm still being punished. Lord, this isn't fair. Does this ring true to us today? Absolutely it does. It says in verse 15, if I had said I will speak thus, behold, I would have betrayed the generation of your children. When I pondered to understand this, it was troublesome in my sight. It means he couldn't figure it out. 
Like us, you and I, we can't figure out why things happen in this side of eternity. But notice in verse 17, it all made sense finally. Until I came into the sanctuary of God, then I perceived their end. Amen? When he came into the sanctuary of God, when he comes into the covenant of God, he begins to realize that they are living a dead-end lifestyle. They're going to pay a price, verse 18. Surely you set them in slippery places. You cast them down on destruction. How they are destroyed in a moment. They are utterly swept away by sudden terrors like a dream when one awakes. O Lord, when aroused, you will despise their form. When my heart was embittered and I was pierced within, then I was senseless and ignorant. I was like a beast before you. Again, a a, a mimic of how people live outside of Christ and find themselves living with an embittered heart because they are using social justice to equate to how how God deals with humanity. And if it doesn't line up with their moral compass, they blame God. Verse 23, nonetheless, I am continually with you. You've taken hold of my right hand. With your counsel, you will guide me and afterward receive me to the glory. Whom I have, whom have I in heaven but you? And besides you, I desire nothing on earth. For my flesh and my heart may fail, but God is the strength of my heart and my portion forever. For behold, those who are far from you will perish. You have destroyed all those who are unfaithful to you. But as for me, the nearness of God is my good. I've made the Lord God my refuge that I may tell of all your works. Amen. Isn't that amazing? The psalmist is writing during a time that he's struggling with injustice, immorality, unfairness. And here we are thousands of years later struggling with the exact same thing but with the same result as believers in Christ, God is our refuge. We can rest in God even when there's conflict around us, even when we feel trapped in by the world, as sin is pushing on us, as Satan is attacking us, we can take refuge and like the lady in the car, be set free and not be trapped by the things of the world. Now, why are they saying hallelujah? Go back to chapter 19 as this group of people in heaven continue to praise the Lord. Why do they say that? You'll notice here in verse three, at the end of verse three, why are they praising? Because her smoke rises up forever and ever. It literally means the destruction of everything I just explained. The injustices, the the financial injustice, the legal injustice, the social injustice, all the injustices of the world are going to be destroyed and made right. And therefore, those in heaven celebrate and sing hallelujah because the smoke rises forever. As we've been going through the book of Revelation, I've been talking about how in a lot of ways, this book is very symbolic, not to be taken literal. Like the rest of scriptures, this one is different. It's, it's a, a lot of symbols. And when some people re- look at verse three about the smoke rising forever, they say this is a good example of the symbolicness of the verse and to the city of Babylon because we see over in 2 Peter chapter three where it says, but by the day of the Lord will come like a thief in which the heavens will pass away with a roar and the elements will be destroyed with intense heat and the earth and its works will be burned up. So from a preterist standpoint, through the optics of a preterist, this clearly shows that this is not just the city of Babylon, but this could be the entire world will be destroyed as you and I as believers know this to be true. Verse four, as this celebration continues, As those in heaven celebrate and praise the Lord for who he is and what he's about to do, notice in verse four what happens. It says, the inhabitants of the heavens who are close to the Lord fall down on their face and worship God. And John gives us very specific detail who these people are. It says, the 24 elders. We've already learned in the book of Revelation that the 24 elders represent the church. 
We also know that the four living creatures are these specific seraphim angels that praise God on a regular basis. So therefore, the imagery, the scene that we see is that God is about to move and in the tribulation period, and there is a massive celebration going on in heaven. And people are going nuts because God is about to set everything free and deal with those who have fallen into sin. I wanna show you for a second over in Isaiah chapter six. Jump over to the left for me real quick. Go to Isaiah chapter six because it gives us a little bit, the prophet Isaiah gives us a little bit clearer image of who these angels are that are around God. We have talked about them before, but in Isaiah chapter six, we notice in verse two, the prophet Isaiah says, seraphim stood above him, meaning God, each having six wings, with two he covered his face, with two he covered his feet, and with the two others he flew. And one called out to another and said, holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. Now, again, in, in context, keep in mind, church, that these seraphim, this is all they do. And this is all they've ever been doing. And this is all they're ever going to do. So from the foundations of God, these angels have been sitting around God, praising God. Can you imagine what that scene must look like? Can you imagine every day for the rest of eternity, you having to stand there and praise and worship somebody? I'd last like five minutes. But these angels are worshiping God. Why? Because he is righteous and holy. And these angels worship him over and over and over. Go back to Revelation 19. As these 24 elders and four living creatures fell down and worshiped God who sat on the throne, and they say, meaning the people of heaven say, amen and hallelujah, the word amen is an affirming word. It means to affirm what is being said. It's to affirm what is being done. That's why often I'll say to you after maybe I read a particular area of scripture, I'll say to you as the church, amen, and you respond back to me, amen. Because we're affirming the truth of the word of God. Hallelujah is a word used to praise God himself. It's a praising word. It's to give God praise for who he is. Then in verse five, look what happens. And a voice came from the throne saying, so John hears another voice. Again, in the book of Revelation, this has been an ongoing scenario where John continues to hear voices from heaven in his imagery or in his writing. And he doesn't always tell us who it is, but if we read down in the text in certain times, he will describe it to us. Here he says, a voice came from heaven saying, give praise to God. This is a call or a, a call to action for those that are in heaven with the Lord, those believers, you and I that are in heaven, if we're there, we are called to give praise to the Lord. It's this ongoing call. So this voice literally says to those in heaven, give praise to our God. It's like, hey, keep going and don't stop. Can I suggest that maybe that is a, um, a, a way for you and I to navigate struggles in our lives as an antidote? Meaning that as we go through adversity in life, do we find ourselves praising God for the circumstance we're in? Do we ever say, you know what, Lord, thank you so much that I just totaled my car. Lord, thank you so much that my 401k now is down millions of dollars. You know, can, can this be an antidote for you and I as believers to say, you know what, Lord? In the good and the bad, I will always praise you. No matter what happens in my life, I will always praise you, Lord, for who you are. And then I love what it kind of says here, John, he, he, he doesn't just give a particular group to praise people, to praise the Lord. He calls all people to praise the Lord, all bond servants, literally the, the lowliest of all people, a bond servant, 
A bond servant church, by the way, is, is what we would maybe call in our day today a slave. A bond servant is, is somebody who literally has said, you know what, uh, I, I'm able to be free, but I choose not to be free. So you had two types of, of, of servants or slaves, if you will, in these days. You had the slave who was truly a slave. And if that slave, through whatever Levitical law, whatever law there was, or through finances, or through works, through effort, if that owner of the slave found favor in that slave, that owner could say, hey, you know what? I'm gonna set you free. Because of who you are, what you, whatever the circumstance, the owner could say, I'm gonna set you free. The slave had two choices. They could be like, thank you, I'm out of here, I'm gone. Or that slave could say, you know what? You've been such a good and righteous owner to me. I'm going to be a bond servant, meaning I'm going to choose to serve you for the rest of my life. A bond servant. That's why so often you and I are called bond servants of the Lord. We've made a decision. We've been set free by the blood of Christ on the cross, and we've now become bond servants of his. And so this vivid image that John is seeing here when he says the bond servants and those who are small and great, what John literally is saying in our text today for us to understand is, is that all intellectual ability, social strata, all accomplishments, all levels of progress you've had in your life, all of those things will be dissipated into nothingness and we will all become equal and one in worshiping the Lord. Amen? It means that, man, in heaven, you and I are the same. No matter what you see going on around us, no matter what John is explaining, no matter what the psalmist said in 73, all these people have elevated socially, financially, whatever the implication is, even though you have a desire or a lust to have and be like that, John says, but in heaven we will all be the same. None of that will be in play anymore. Then in verse six, John speaks of this multitude of voice the sounds that he hears. I want you to recognize that there are three words like, verse six, verse seven, and I think down in verse nine, I think. There's three likes, the word like, underline the word like, because this shows us that this is not exactly thunder. It's not exactly like any particular thing. John is saying literally, man, I am hearing something that is kind of like, a multitude of people or, or, or like many waters or, or, or like thunder. And it's saying here that he hears all of this and that the Lord reigns and he's just blown away by what he is hearing. These glorious sounds. We, we've already seen this back in Revelation chapter six, verse one, where we've seen the, the sounds of thunder, the mightiness of what is happening. And, and for, for so long, you and I have been calling for the Lord's kingdom to come, that his will be will be done on earth as it is in heaven, the Lord's prayer. And all of a sudden now John is experiencing this glorious reaction from people in heaven that it absolutely sounds amazing. And so he stands back and he goes, how can I possibly describe the glorious sound coming from heaven right now through the worshiping of the elders, the four living creatures and the saints. And so John pins it as, man, it was like water. You ever been to a, a waterfall? You ever been to the bottom of a waterfall and how loud that is? You can't hear anything, it's just loud and, and thunder and lightning, it's just, it's nuts. Like we were down at the beach for 4th of July camping and the 4th of July fireworks were going on and like many of your dogs, our dog was a big baby. He's an 80 pound baby that is really, they've been bred to hunt lions. That's what they're known for. But he doesn't like wet grass he, and he doesn't like to go outside if it's raining and he's afraid of fireworks. And if he could crawl inside of himself at the 4th of July, he would have. It was the weirdest thing to watch. He's pacing around, he's like getting, he's circling, he's trying to get under our bed, even though you can't get under the bed. He's freaking out because of what? The sound. Can you imagine what this sound must sound like for those that are around to hear it? And literally what John is saying, upon millions, upon millions, upon millions of people in heaven, they are glorifying God so much 
so much it sounds like thunder, many waters, and multitude. Awesome. Then we notice in verse 7, and I'm going to spend a little bit of time here because this is incredibly profound. It moved me quite a bit as I was studying this and looking at this. It was amazing what I learned out of this. And this thing in verse 7, it says, let us rejoice and be glad and give glory to him. You know, Jesus said in Matthew chapter 5, rejoice and be glad for your reward in heaven is great for in the same way they persecuted the prophets who were before you. I think that's a call for our joy right there, church. I think it's a call to, to have joy in our life, meaning that no wonder what, no matter what's going on around us for injustices or unfairness, we're called to be joyful. I feel like that's an art that many believers we've lost. We've lost the ability to be joyful, to be happy. We walk around miserable, defeated. We walk around like Christians, life is the worst life ever. Who'd ever want to join it? You have a scowl on your face all the time. It, it, so he calls us, hey, listen, an antidote, a, 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 a cure, if you will, is to give God praise. We learned that back in verse uh, five. Give God praise even in adverse times and live a life of joy. Joy, like excitement and, and, and happiness. And again, it's something that I struggle with. You know, it's always, it is hard to always be joyful. You know, life's difficult. Kids are difficult. Marriage, work, friends, whatever. It's a struggle, but he calls us to be joyful. Now, let me kind of dig in with this with you about this whole marriage of the lamb. Incredibly, incredibly fascinating. In order to fully understand what we're going to get into, we need to take our current 19th, 19th century marriage out of the equation, meaning how do we do weddings today, okay? Let's pretend we could erase that out of our mind, go back a couple thousand years from now, and look at how a Jewish wedding transpired. Because in the ancient world, a marriage and the celebration of marriage was one of the greatest celebrations known in the ancient world. I want you to kind of really try to put yourself there because in the ancient times, they didn't have cell phones, they didn't have cars, they didn't have social media, they didn't have the things to create joy in one's life. Therefore, getting together with friends and family or a wedding celebration was the most significant thing they could do. As a matter of fact, I've shared with you before where I work, we have a lot of uh, Chaldeans that live kind of in an area that I work in, meaning that they've come over from Iraq, Iran, Afghanistan, and they've come to the United States under the tenet of religious freedom. Most of them are Catholic, but there's something significant about their culture. And that culture, when we go to someone's house because they're injured, there are always a lot of people in their house, right? If it is somebody that has passed away when we get there, not only is everybody there in the house freaking out, we now have extended family showing up freaking out. And they're very, very animated, right? We know this because this is their culture. They begin to tear their shirts, they wail, they throw shoes, they fall on the ground. Very, very animated. And for us fire guys, we're like, oh boy, here comes the Calvary, because we see cars doing 90 miles an hour to the house, hitting their brakes, people are flying out of the car, right? And they're freaking out, because that's that culture. Family is very, very important to them. I would even say that's even true with the Hispanic culture. Very, very, very relational. I've learned this through Baseball Chapel. It's taught me that that culture is very, very relational. Now, for us Caucasian culture, not so much. We put fences around our house. We lock our doors. We put alarms on. We put gates around our house. And we put up signs that says, like, hope you can run faster than my dog or hope you can outrun my bullet. Whatever it is, it literally means don't come near me. Right? I don't want you to be around here. Don't come near me. We're quite the opposite. But in these days, a wedding was a massive, massive event. The greatest social event to happen in those days. Now, in this ancient Jewish marriage, 
the process, the journey, there was three key elements that I want to share with you about it. Number one was the betrothal period. This is this engagement period, if you will. Now, understand in those days, in the ancient Jewish typology, you would have parents or dads that would come together and do a contract with each other, and they would be pre-recognized marriages. Now, can you all imagine that? Now, see, in our culture, people would flip their lids because it would be like, not my choice. I want to choose. Don't tell me what to do, right? We live in that culture now. But in those days, it was very normal for a dad that might have a friend or somebody that he knows go to him and go, hey, I have a two-year-old son. You have a two-year-old daughter. Let's, uh, let's do a contract right now. They'll marry each other when they get older, okay? So what would happen would be the dad of the, of the groom, he would have to pay a price to the daughter's dad. Whatever that price was, whether it was gold, silver, sheep, camels, horses, whatever it was, whatever they agreed upon, the groom's dad would pay the bride's dad money, and now they are betrothed. They are financially, contractually bound together, okay? So they're contractually bound together. And so they would prepare the, the, the groom then, as the groom got older and started to grow up and grow up, there would be a period of time where the groom would leave his soon-to-be bride, meaning just spending time with them. They haven't consummated the marriage yet. They're, they're, they're engaged, if you will. They're betrothed, if you will. And the groom would then go to his parents' house and begin to add on to the parents' house for him and his wife to live with his parents, right? Some of you right now are like, oh, oh heck no, that would <laughs> never fly, right? Some people are going back to that for financial reasons by making a granny flat so the in-laws can live in the back, right? And then the kids get the big house in the front. Anyway, so in those days, under the law, the groom would be released from any type of military commitment for that year as he began to build this house for him and his wife to live in after they got married, okay? So that's the normal way of doing things. The second piece was called the presentation piece. This is a time of festivities. Just prior to the actual wedding itself, these festivities would take place potentially for multiple days, maybe for a week, whatever the financial implication was, however the family was, they would be celebrating for a week. Now, now all you brides in here, can you imagine having to throw a party for all your friends and family for a week? You think one day is expensive, right? Imagine entertaining your family and friends for a week before the vows took place. So this is called this presentation period, and those things could last for several days, or it could last a week. And then finally comes this vow period, where they exchange vows, and then comes this consummation time, the, the intimacy part that finally closes the door and brings in the culmination of this contractual pre-planned marriage, it finally comes into fulfillment with the consummation period. Again, Mary and Joseph, Mary, the mother of Jesus, they were betrothed. They had a contract in place. Mary, some think she was about 15-ish. Some think Joseph was much older. But what, if you go back and read the story, what does Joseph want to do? He wants to file for what? A divorce. Even though the marriage had not been consummated, why? Because Jesus was imputed into Mary through the Holy Spirit. Joseph thought his wife cheated on him. He wanted to do a silent divorce to not make a mockery of her, so they were betrothed at this point. And this becomes really important because we see that the Lord has betrothed, betrothed himself to you and I. When we go back and we look in this particular verse and it talks about the marriage of the lamb, you and I as people, as the church, we are the bride. And the groom is coming for us. 
as his bride. As a matter of fact, in 2 Corinthians chapter 11, Paul talks about the church in the most beautiful language when he says, I betrothed you to one husband, that to Christ I might present you as a, a pure virgin. And so in that particular verse, we see the two words, betrothal and the presentation. And so church, again, we can get into social conflict, we can talk about the complexities of marriages, we can talk about same-sex marriages, all that stuff, but again, looking at this area of scripture, it is clearly between a, a groom and a bride. Again, enhancing God's original design for marriage showing the clarity of the original plan for God's marriage. And so what we see is this contract, follow me here, we see this contract that the Lord signed for you and I. As it goes back to those young children of the Jewish dad of the groom and the Jewish dad of the bride, those two dads sign a contract and they pay a price for them to be married. What does God do for you and I? He betroths us, through Jesus. In Hebrews chapter 13, look at this, what it says. Now the God of peace, who brought up from the dead the great shepherds of the sheep, through the blood of the eternal covenant, even Jesus our Lord. It follows the imagery, church, of an earthly marriage. God is saying, I paid for a relationship with you, Jack, and the price that I paid was my son's blood, a covenant. Therefore, Jack, you're mine. I have an co eternal covenant contract with you. And you and I are gonna come together and we are going to be one in marriage in the future. And so this imagery of following a marriage is absolutely amazing. But guess what? The marriage hasn't been consummated with you and I in Christ yet. Because why? Because Christ is off preparing something. Let me show you, John chapter 14. Let's jump over to John real quick. In John chapter 14, we see these famous words by Jesus himself when he says in John 14, verse one, he's telling people about heaven. Jesus is describing what it's like in heaven to people, and he says in John 14, verse one, do not let your heart be troubled. Believe in God, believe also in me. Look at this piece right here. In my Father's house are many dwelling places. If it were not so, I would not have told you, for I go to prepare a place for you. If I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back again and receive you to myself, that where I am, there you may also be. Go back to the ancient Jewish wedding. What was the groom doing? He was preparing a place for his bride. He was building a room addition to his parents' house so they could live with the family. When you look at that John verse and Jesus says, there are many rooms. I'm going to prepare for you and I will come back and receive you as my bride to live with me in eternity. Is that not awesome? That is amazing. The imagery here, this, this whole idea of being married into Christ. And oh, let me show you something else. Matthew chapter 25. Maybe we'll stop here. Matthew chapter 25. There's another example that Jesus gives. It's, it's fascinating. Again, it alludes right into the marriage. Matthew 25. So what have we seen so far? We've seen God pay a price through his son Jesus, an eternal covenant to have us as his bride, We've seen Jesus say that my father is preparing many rooms for you, the same imagery as an ancient Jewish presentation or of marriage, and now we give another example of God coming back for his bride. Jesus says in Matthew 25, look what he says here, regarding the 10 virgins, or better yet, it's really the 10 uh, uh, bridesmaids, if you will. It says this, then the kingdom of heaven will be comparable to 10 virgins who took their lamps and went out to meet the bridegroom. Let me just explain this quickly. In the ancient times, when the groom was gone for the year, creating a place for him and his wife to live, 
as he's coming back, the bridesmaid's job was to tell the bride, hey, your groom's coming. We see him. He's coming down the road. Get ready. He's coming. Be ready. Okay? So that was their job. Now look what Jesus is saying here. He says, number two, verse two, five of them were foolish and five were prudent. For when the foolish took their lamps, they took no oil with them, but the prudent took oil in the flask along with their lamps. Now while the bridegroom was delaying, they all got drowsy and began to sleep. But at midnight, there was a shout, behold the bridegroom, come out to meet him. Then all those virgins rose and trimmed their lamps. The foolish said to the prudent, give us some of your oil, for our lamps are going out. But the prudent answered, no, there will not be enough for us and you too. Go instead to the dealers and buy some for yourselves. And while they were going away to make the purchase, the bridegroom came and those who were ready went in with him to the wedding feast and the door was shut. Later, the other virgins also came saying, Lord, Lord, open for us. But he answered, truly I say to you, I don't know you. Be on the alert then for who you do not know the day nor the hour. So Jesus uses this imagery of marriage in preparing to receive the groom as a reminder to you and I that a contract has been signed for us. We've been betrothed to the Lord. Therefore, we should be living a life of preparation for his return as the groom as we present ourselves as the bride. Jesus is saying, you better be ready. You better have your oil on. You better be attentive to what's going on because I'm coming back. I've prepared the places for all of you and I'm coming back to receive you, to place you in the kingdom with me forever and ever. Isn't that not amazing? What an illustration of marriage. And so let me just say this final piece. I know we didn't get to verse eight. We'll cover it next time. And that is, it amazes me how people will just completely disregard marriages. Just completely disregard them. I know marriages are tough. I know Christians will get divorced. I know it's not an unpardonable sin. Christians are gonna be saved. They get remarried. I get all of that, church. I understand all that. That's not my focus here. What my focus here is, is people that will enter into a covenant with really no true understanding of the covenant. And when they're in the covenant, they don't make an effort to make themselves presentable to their spouse. And I'm not talking in a look way. I'm talking like in a spiritual, physically, emotionally way. They just get lazy. They don't care. Marriage disintegrates. That's what the 10 virgins illustration is. They weren't prepared. They didn't take it serious. And so in our culture today, man, marriage number four, marriage number five, marriage number seven, Life becomes complex, ugly, a disaster. There's no true eternal covenant anymore. And it baffles me because I do weddings and they stand in front of each other with just this glowingness about them about how much they love this person, right? You're the best thing ever. Till death do us part, rich or poor, health and sickness. You're my sunflower. You bring light to my world, blah, blah, blah. You're the best thing ever. You're like a daisy on a grass field, blowing in the wind. You're the, right? And then six months later, they get a divorce. Why? Because the covenant never meant anything to them. And so as believers in Christ, we have a covenant with Christ that every day, we should be living with joy and excitement because like that lady in the car, we were once trapped by our sin, but now we've been set free. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much, Lord, for your powerful word today. So much to learn today in the book of Revelation. Who would have thought for a moment that the book of Revelation would have had anything to do with marriage? But Lord, you reminded us as that we as the bride one day you will be coming back to receive your bride which is the church which is us as believers father and so may we as people of christ walk every single day for you and with you so that we can present ourselves to you in a holy and pure way lord because you're going to come back so let us be prepared father as always we pray for our country we pray for the world. We pray for a revival, Lord, that the 
people that don't know you, that they would come into relationship with you. Lord, I pray for opportunity for all of us to share the gospel this week with friends, family. Maybe we've had some reservations about doing that, but give us the, the, the authority and the encouragement to do that. So be with us, protect us as we go into the world this week. It's your son's holy and precious name we pray, amen.